Okay, last unit uh, for philosophy of religion, and we're going to talk about heaven and hell. Typically, uh, in introduction to philosophy of religion classes, when people talk about the afterlife, they're interested in an issue to do with personal identity. And this is a topic that actually gets covered in general introductions to philosophy, philosophy 101. Whether or not um, a person in heaven after my death could actually be the same person as me. And this is a very interesting philosophical issue, and there's a lot written about this. Um, but because this is covered in other classes, uh, like I said, there's there's actually a very good um, sort of dialogue written by a philosopher called John Perry that is included in most uh, Philosophy 101 textbooks and available very cheap online. It's published, it, it's a little booklet and it's published by a, a cheap publisher called Hackett. Um, and that goes into all the fascinating issues of whether or not it would, in, even in theory, be possible for me to exist in some non-earthly uh, place, heaven or hell or whatever. Uh, so that's whether or not the uh, an afterlife is philosophically possible. I'm not going to talk about that issue here. We're going to assume uh, that in theory it is. And we're going to talk about other issues specifically to do with the afterlife as it is described in Christianity, certainly also it, uh, Islam and uh, Judaism, um, or at least uh, mainstream versions of those three. Uh, there are versions of all three that say that we don't have an afterlife. Um, if you read Ecclesiastes, the book of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, that certainly seems to imply that there's no life after this one. And uh, it's a strain of thought in Judaism in particular uh, that um, this is all the life there is, that uh, when we die, we cease to exist. There's no afterlife. I'm not going to say that's mainstream Judaism, but certainly it's, um, uh, it's more accepted of you than in, say, Christianity or Islam. Uh, but we're going to assume that it is possible, that uh, uh, it is possible, and we're going to look at the conceptions of heaven and hell. This uh, reminds me, actually, of um, the, if you remember reading the um, introduction to Islam uh, at the beginning of the class, there was a um, uh, an Islamic mystic, a Sufi mystic, uh, a female Sufi mystic uh, whose name tragically escapes me at the moment, who ran through town with a flaming torch in one hand and a bucket in the other, a bucket of water in the other. And when asked about this strange behavior, she said that this symbolized um, her intention to douse the fires of hell with a bucket of water and set fire to heaven with the flaming torch. And the point of this intention is because she argued that having the ideas of heaven and hell as part of your theology meant that your love of God was impure. That in some sense, you weren't really loving God because you recognize that you should love God, that God is just a, a, an awesome being that you should love for that reason. Instead, you're just being obedient to God for the reward or to avoid the punishment. In effect, she was saying that people who believe in an afterlife uh, don't really have the right motives for their love of God. And this is a criticism that atheists often make of, uh, of believers in an afterlife. They say, you know, you're only being good. You're not really a good person. You're only being good because you've got a gun to your head. You think that you're going to be punished after this life unless you do what your religion requires. So don't tell me that you're a moral person. You're not. You're just someone who's, you know, at the end of a gun. Uh, whereas I, the atheist, say, says the atheist, if I do the right thing, I'm doing it because I think it's the right thing. I, I know, I believe that when I die, I'm 
I'm just going to be worm food. And yet I'm still doing the right thing. I'm wasting some of my precious time on earth to do the right thing. That makes me a much better person than someone who uh, believes in an afterlife. That uh, well-known line of argument is not discussed in the reading uh, that I gave you, the Walls reading. Um, so I'm going to focus on the topics that he brings up. He brings them up rather quickly, so I'm going to expand them a little. He, he brings uh, some interesting topics up rather quickly and then dwells rather long on a dispute that he evidently has with uh, Thomas Talbot. I think there's a back and forth between those two thinkers, Jerry Wall and Thomas Talbot, in you know philosophical journals. So he's sort of hashing out a particular pet peeve in this article. Uh, so I think he spends too much time on Talbot, about the right time if you, if you were writing a paper on Talbot, but at the expense of fleshing out other interesting topics that he kind of passes over very quickly in what should be a sort of overview article that gives equal time to, to everybody. All right. So actually, um, it's kind of odd, but uh, this seems to be true, that hell gets a lot more uh, time given to it by uh, philosophers of religion. Uh, heaven seems uninteresting to them. And if you think about it, um, the great works of literature, uh, Paradise Lost and uh, Dante's Inferno, where they talk about hell, it's a lot more well known and well thought of than whatever time they give to talking about heaven. So we're 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 more drawn to discussions of hell. It seems more interesting to us. And in Milton, uh, the devil gets all the best lines, um, despite the fact that he's a he's a Christian and and obviously doesn't want to drive you to Satan, but. You know, it's it's a saying that the devil has all the best tunes, too. Which, of course, you know, if it's true that you get sent to hell for misbehavior, then probably every rocker and rapper is down there right now. Um, okay, so the uh, traditional picture of hell... Well, when I say traditional, it's not clear that this goes all the way back to the Bible, because actually the Bible, certainly the Old Testament, is kind of uh, vague on the subject of the afterlife. Like I said, Ecclesiastes famously appears to deny uh, that there is an afterlife. You know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that kind of business. Uh, all is vanity. Uh, if you read it um, or listen to the bird song, which is basically Ecclesiastes set to music, um, it, it it seems to suggest that you know we're, our, our brief time on this earth is all we've got. So certainly the Bible doesn't speak with a single voice and doesn't really flesh out a view of heaven and hell. So when I say the traditional model of hell, it's it's a model that has grown up over the centuries. Um, since and influenced a lot by works of literature like a lot of our view of satan for example comes from works of literature like uh, milton's paradise lost and is not actually um from the bible it's uh, it's you know comes from later views i mean for uh, for example i'm going a little bit off topic but um people often assume that uh satan appears repeatedly in the Bible. And while he certainly is mentioned, one of the cases that people often assume is Satan is the, the snake in the Garden of Eden that tempts Eve to eat the apple. But in fact, it never says that Satan in the Bible, in Genesis, it just says it's a snake. It's only later interpretations who've assumed that this is the devil tempting him. But actually later on after that, Satan is, of course, uh, one of uh, God's angels originally, or at least that's that's one version of the story, and uh, is working for God. Uh, and Satan tempts Job on God's instructions. Um, so it's kind of weird if he was already working against God in Genesis. Anyway, um, 
actually discussions of hell don't, uh, this discussion of hell doesn't mention Satan, and this whole idea that Satan rules in hell is itself kind of controversial within um, within Christianity. It's, a, it's something that is true in Paradise Lost, but uh, a lot of Christian denominations assume that uh, Satan walks the earth rather than um, sort of sitting around in the flames of hell. That's more of a Marvel Comics uh, picture. They've got a character in Marvel Comics called Mephisto, who uh, sits down in the fires of hell. Um, okay, so the traditional model of hell makes three claims about hell. And for once, I wrote it up. Uh, okay, so we've got the traditional model of hell. The first claim I've called anti-universalism, which is uh, what it's sometimes called, because universalism is the rejection of the first claim. Universalism is essentially the idea that everybody gets saved. In other words, that nobody goes to hell. Everybody makes it to the good place. Everybody goes to heaven. That's universalism. So if you believe that some people are in hell or hell is not empty, then you're an anti-universalist. You believe, you deny that everybody is saved. You think some people don't make it. All right. Uh, that's one claim that hell, you know, there are some people in hell or there will be some people. That's another actually dispute. Uh, it's unclear whether or not there are people in heaven and hell now. There are some part, there are verses in the Bible that imply that nobody will be in heaven. Uh, until after the Day of Judgment, which has yet to come. Whereas other suggestions seem to be that, you know, we arrive there immediately, uh, uh, whichever we are going to, on our death. And I think that's the usual assumption. But, again, uh, the Bible seems to suggest otherwise. And there's this puzzle about, well, if we don't go straight to heaven or hell, where do we go when we die? Are we sort of in limbo? Are we... Um, uh, materialist interpreters of the Bible says we, we cease to exist and then God makes us anew on the day of judgment and gives us material bodies. This is the non-spiritual interpretation of, of Christianity. Um, which means there's this long gap in our existence. When we die, all these people who are already dead, you know, suppose you die in 1066, you're the English King Harold who gets shot in the eye in 1066. Well, you've been dead for you know, over a thousand years. Is it over a thousand years? Not quite. Uh, nearly a thousand years. And um, you just don't ex you haven't existed all that time, but you will exist again after the Day of Judgment. Well, that creates a philosophical problem of how can there be this big gap in your existence. Again, we're not going to get into that. Um, so let's assume that we're just, whether or not... Um, it's after the Day of Judgment. We're talking about uh, eventually. Eventually, hell will not be empty. That's the idea of anti-universalism. Second claim. Uh, the motivation for hell is one of punishment. That is, you get to go to hell because you've been bad. Uh, or God is sending you to hell as punishment. In other words, think of alternatives to this. It could be just God sends you to hell for kicks. That doesn't present God in a very nice light. That makes you sound like some kind of a sadist. So if God is going to send some people to this bad place, uh, it must be because they've done something wrong. That's one aspect of punishment. And the other aspect of punishment is uh, that hell is horrible. So uh, there, there are two aspects to punishment. One, the motivation for you being there is because you've been bad. You're being punished. And the other thing is, it is a punishment in that, as all punishments are, it's painful. It's a nasty experience. Because, you know, you can imagine hell has just been um, boring or something like that. Or uh, hell is the kind of place that... I mean, uh, I think I mentioned in a previous video that I, I saw once... Um, on some religious channel, uh, this woman with the most amazing huge pink wig uh, was talking about, she said this, she said, um, if, you, if you're the kind of person who likes peace and quiet, well, heaven won't be for you, because heaven has 10,000 people saying hallelujah at the top of their lungs every second of every day. 
And at this I thought, well, there goes my last incentive to be good, because that sure sounds like hell to me. Um, you know, maybe you could imagine hell is nice and quiet. So I say, well, hell, hell for me, um, because, you know, I, I don't want to be with the holy rollers yelling hallelujah every second. That would just give me a migraine. Uh, but no, that doesn't fit with the traditional model of hell. The traditional model of hell is you'd want to be up there shouting hallelujah because the alternative is being, you know, the descriptions in Paradise Lost and Dante's Inferno of the sufferings of the damned are pretty vivid. And actually, that's true in, in Buddhism, too. Um, uh, there are lurid depictions of Buddhist hell where people are sort of you know, the flesh is pulled off their bones while they're alive and things like this. All right, number three, no exit. Yeah, I, this is uh, the cheap um, video. I should, uh, I should have written it again uh, nicely, but I couldn't be bothered. So that says no exit. In other, way, in other words, you, you can't get out of hell. There is one famous exception to this. Uh, described in the New Testament in one of the Gospels, I think it may be Luke, called the harrowing of hell. And in this telling, after the crucifixion, in the three days between the crucifixion and um, the resurrection, Jesus goes to hell and preaches to the damned in hell and brings some of them out of hell with him. But that's supposedly a famous exception. You know, supposing that happened, that was just a one-off. Other than that, nobody gets out of hell. Nobody gets out of hell by repentance. Nobody gets out of hell by suicide. It's not like prison. You can't, you know, commit suicide and escape that way. And nobody gets out of hell by ceasing to exist annihilation. That's the traditional model of hell, sometimes called the punishment model of hell. Now, there are challenges to this view. Um, the most famous challenge to this, or the most uh, widely given, uh, is called by Walls the proportionality problem. Um, there is a, uh, a principle that is actually mentioned in the Bible. Uh, everyone is familiar with the Old Testament principle, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now, that's usually seen as kind of, uh, well, it, it, it's where we get the phrase Old Testament justice. It seems like pretty severe. So, in other words, usually people who are defending the death penalty appeal to this principle. If you've killed somebody, then you have to be killed. For, uh, you know... That's usually the only context it comes up in. You know, nobody says if you're a rapist, you should be raped. Um, but the idea of the of Lex Talionis was actually, uh, by the way, that's the, the, the Latin name for this principle, Lex Talionis. Um, the idea of this principle was actually rather a, a liberal principle. It set an upper limit to uh, punishment. If you read things like uh, uh, Les Miserables, uh, you'll know that in, the, in Les Miserables, poor people who stole loaves of bread were given the death penalty for stealing a loaf of bread. That would be breaking Lex Talionis because it would be giving you too much punishment. It would be giving you way more punishment than is appropriate. The punishment should fit the crime, should be proportional to the crime. So if you commit a very low-level crime, you should get a mild punishment. That seems to be a principle of justice. We think it's unjust if somebody, you know, is walking down the middle of the road and asked to move and on being on refusing to move is shot six times. We think that's disproportionate. Um, the uh, so the proportionality problem in um, in the discussion of hell is that if hell is eternal, and that's part of what no, the no exit claim says, you're there for eternity, you are immortal. Once you're in hell, you are immortal, which is why you can't um, escape by suicide or annihilation. You will exist for infinity. So combine the fact that you're being punished with the fact that you will exist for infinity. 
and your punishment is infinite. You are being, you have an infinite punishment. You are uh, suffering infinitely. What kind of wrongdoing merits infinite punishment? Well, the proportionality challenge says no kind of crime merits infinite punishment because we are finite beings. We exist for a finite amount of time on this finite earth of ours. We, there's only so much we can do because we, you know, we can't destroy universes. We're comparatively puny. So even the most horrific you know, mass murderers, even people like Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot who, who caused the death of millions, even they don't deserve an infinite punishment they just deserve like one for a few million years, maybe, but not infinite. The difference between a few million years and infinity is infinity. There is an infinity of million of a few million years is in infinity. Um, so no human could commit a crime heinous enough to merit infinite punishment. And I was, uh, I don't know about you, um, well, this is, you know, I went into philosophy for a reason. I was, um, I was the kind of kid who, who had weird thoughts when I was little. Uh, and one of the thoughts that occurred to me was, it seems like there's a pretty narrow dividing line between heaven and hell. There's no in between. Heaven is an infinity of reward. Hell is an infinity of punishment. And there's nothing in between. And what if you're, suppose there has to be a dividing line where if you're above that line, you get to go to heaven because, you know, you have to go to one of those two places and you're above the line. So you go to heaven. And if you're above, below the line, you go to hell. But suppose there's very, very little difference between someone who's just above the line and someone who's just below the line. So, you know, maybe somebody, the difference is, this person said one more swear, no, this person said one more swear word in their life than this person, but otherwise they did about the same. So this person gets an infinity of punishment and this person gets an infinity of reward for one little swear word difference. That's ridiculous. But how else are you going to divide people up? Um, you know, if you only send saints to heaven, it's going to be pretty underpopulated. If you only send the worst of the worst to hell, um, well, there's still going to be someone who committed quite a few murders who gets to go to heaven, and that doesn't seem right. So however you do it, if you only have heaven and hell as your only two options, that's gonna, there's going to be a dividing line that seems like unjust. It seems like a huge injustice that someone just above this line gets infinity of reward, the best possible reward, and somebody just below it gets the worst possible thing ever. That's part of the proportionality problem. Okay. In response to the proportionality problem, um, various people have said various things. One response that Walls doesn't talk about is some people say that, well, any sin is a crime against God, and as God is an infinite being, uh, then it's an infinite crime, so you deserve infinite punishment. That's a bit dubious, because it's not usually the victim of the crime that determines your length of punishment. It's the nature of the crime. I mean, we don't say, well, that person murdered someone smelly who nobody likes, so let's give them one year. Whereas that person uh, murdered a really popular person, murdered a celebrity, let's give them 20 years. We would say it shouldn't matter. Murder is murder. It doesn't matter who the victim is. It's not the, the victim that should determine the length of sentence. It's the nature of the crime. Uh, so that response doesn't seem right. And, and anyway, why is it? Uh, why is God the victim of every sin? I mean, God can't really be a victim of anything. God's omnipotent. Not much of a victim there. Uh, so that one, maybe that's why Wall doesn't mention that one because it's it's pretty feeble. An alternative, um, the the alternative that uh, Wall does mention is to totally, uh, well, is essentially to reject two, or at least the, the element of two. Uh, so remember, there are two aspects to number two. First of all, 
that uh, the punishment, the reason why you're in hell is because God, like some cosmic cop or cosmic parent, is in, inflicting punishment on you. So it's not something you've chosen. It's something God said, that's it. You're getting your punishment now. I'm going to impose it on you and I'm going to physically take you and put you in, you know, hell. So it's imposed on you. And the other aspect is that it's it's torment. It's physical pain. The um, the alternative is to suggest, no, it's not something God imposes on you. It's something you freely choose. So God is not to blame because part of the proportionality problem is it makes God look bad. It makes God look unjust because he's imposing this punishment on you and it's way out of proportion. Um, so the way that the the response to this goes is, well, first of all, they say, ah, it's not really God imposing this on you. It's you choosing it. And in fact, God is not imposing something on you against your will. He is respecting your choice. This seems to be um, the essence of Jonathan Kvanvig's, uh, what does he call it, issuant conception. So just, uh, and actually... Um, Kvanvig, I know, is also concerned with another problem for hell. The other problem for hell is concerns uh, is what you might call an asymmetry problem, which is that there seems to be a difference in motivation between heaven and hell. It seems like you should have the same motivation for sending someone to heaven as you should have to hell. Otherwise, you're, you've got you know you've got two different decision schemes going. But actually, the usual reason for sending people to heaven is God's love. That's why you end up in heaven, because God loves you. Whereas the usual uh, motivation for sending people to hell, and certainly on the punishment model, is God's justice. In other words, God is sending to hell because that is the right thing to do. Well, actually, if you remember the Kant reading on uh, worship, that is sort of taking two conflicting views of God. The God as the sort of benevolent monarch who can show mercy on you, and God as the perfect judge who isn't allowed to show mercy because mercy is not justice. So if there are two competing justifications, love for heaven and justice for hell, you, you end up with an, uh, an inconsistent system for where you get where you end up. Uh, now, this has led some people to say, well, because God is love, God loves us all, so we'll all go to heaven. That's it. that's what the universalists um, believe. They believe that they reject, number one, and for example, Marilyn Adams and Thomas Talbot take this approach. They reject anti-universalism because they are universalists, and they believe that hell is empty, that the loving God of Christianity would not send people to the kind of torment. They believe that hell is, as the traditional model presents it, that it's a place of torment that is inflicted on you. And they say no, uh, the loving God of Christianity wouldn't send anybody there. So Marilyn Adams and Thomas Talbot uh, believe that hell is empty, essentially. They're universalists. Whereas um, people like Kvanvig and Charles Seymour and also C.S. Lewis, you know, the writer of the Narnia books, and Swinburne, Richard Swinburne, who we've already read a section for, from in the Problem of Evil uh, unit, they all say, no, hell is not imposed on you. Hell is something you choose. And furthermore, and, well, then you might say, well, so I'm presented with a choice. Uh, and there's one doorway where I see all these flames coming out of it, and one doorway leading upwards with a bright light and beautiful music playing, and, and I choose the fiery one. Who the hell would ever do that? And that's sort of uh, Talbot's point. Nobody would ever choose that. So Talbot rejects the, the, free w the free will response that, you know, hell is chosen, because he views hell as this place of fire and torment, you know, the, the, the popular depiction of it. So if you're going to say hell is chosen, it doesn't really make sense to say that hell is like Dante and uh, 
and Milton present it, you know, a place of torture. So the way they present it is it's just being apart from God. So if you reject God, then you choose hell. Now, what is hell like? It's not flame and torment. It's just isolation from God. You don't get to be with God. Now, in some versions, this will be welcomed by, you know, some by atheists or people who are angry at God. Um, they won't want to be with God. They won't accept God. So they'll actually choose. No, I don't want to be with God because, you know, God caused all those diseases. God, God caused Ebola. God, you know, tortures babies. I, I reject you, God. So I'm going to choose to be apart from you. Uh, that would be then you you go to hell. But it's because of your choice. Um, now, Swinburne actually says that uh, people would choose hell because they just developed the kind of personality that is incapable of uh, embracing God. They, they, um, they become so rotten through repeated uh, rotten behavior and it sort of reinforces this character within them that they cannot choose to be with God. So however hell is, they can't choose heaven because they're just incapable of, of walking the straight and narrow. Um, now, uh, Kleinvig and Seymour, Jonathan Kleinvig and Charles Seymour, reject the no exit principle. They, they, they also reject that it's for punishment because they're in the free will crowd. They say hell is something that you freely choose. But um, the reason why you're in hell is because you've rejected God. However, you can change. You can realize over the millennia that, you know, it sucks being apart from God and that you're there because of your, you know, your rejection of God. And you can say, I changed my mind. I choose to accept God. And they allow that people can repent and make it to be saved. Which means that in the long run, if you think about it, hell would be empty because nobody's going to stay there for all eternity. And maybe that's essentially Talbot's point that, uh, uh, yes, he, he, he doesn't imply that nobody goes to hell. He, he implies that nobody would stay in hell because it would be, you cannot, he believes that you are essentially psychologically, this is Thomas Talbot that Walls talks about quite a lot, that you are psychologically incapable of forcing yourself through torment. Remember, he, he actually has the view that hell is, is torment, physical torment. There's a distinction made that, the, uh, that there are different kinds of pain. There's the pain, physical pain of like being, you know, the, the Dante memorably describes like being burned, burnt to death and then recreated and then burnt to death again, you know, so that you feel agonies. That's physical pain. But there's also uh, the pain of loss. So um, on the free will version of hell, you experience the pain of separation from God. A pain of loss, but you know, if you're an atheist, presumably you don't you don't feel this because you never felt one with God in the first place. Um, so you can reject the punishment model by rejecting anti-universalism, uh, which is the Adams and Talmud uh, response. Uh, Marilyn Adams says. Um, both Adams and Tolbert are sort of in responding to the free will crowd, uh, these guys, Lewis, Swinburne, Cranvig, and Seymour. They sort of respond to them and say, look, you're overplaying the value of human, the value and capacity of humans. Um, why is, because the usual, the, the free will response is actually a bit like the free will response to the problem of evil. Remember, the problem of evil is, why do we suffer? Well, you could say that this is a special case of why do we suffer? Why do we suffer in hell? And the, the uh, answer is, of the free will defense against the problem of evil, is that uh, free will is this wonderful, valuable thing. And unfortunately, it brings evil with it, uh, but it's worth it. So presumably, when applied to hell, it would be, that it is a wonderful thing that you have free will and God respects it, even if it means you ending up in hell for all eternity. How wonderful can free will be? I mean, it seems like 
he can't be that wonderful, can it? And think, uh, and as Marilyn Adams, she says, we're acting as if our free will is like a pearl beyond price, but that's to inflate the value of humankind. We should view ourselves in respect to God as more like tiny infants in respect to their mother. Should the mother respect every whim of the tiny infant because it's their free will? You know, the tiny infant wants to run into the road to chase a ball. Should the mother say, well, I can't, I can't stop their free choice because free choice is a pearl beyond price. Of course not. The mother stops them and says, don't be stupid. I'll let you do what, I'll let you choose within reason, but if you're choosing something that stupid, I'll stop you for your own good. And presumably, says Marilyn Adams, God would do the same thing. If you're choosing hell, God would not respect your choice. And you'd thank him for it later. You'd say, phew, thank goodness God didn't respect my choice to hell, because otherwise I'd be in hell, and that's awful. So Marilyn Adams thinks that the free will response, you know, is a bit stupid, a bit uh, over dramatizing the, the value of human free will. Um, so she ends up saying, God will save us all. We'll all end up in, hev in heaven. Uh, Talbot says we'll all end up in heaven because nobody could choose hell. Uh, they will repent and God will allow them into he heaven. Uh, and there's a debate between Walls and, um, and uh, Talbot that I'm not going to go into now. If you write on this, you might want to. Um, he makes this distinction between Talbot says sinners have the power to choose he hell and are thus free because you, if you don't have the power to choose hell, then you're not free and your choosing of heaven has no value because you're just being forced. But at the same time, while you have the power to, you are psychologically incapable of doing it. And, you know, this sounds a little dubious saying I have the power to, I just can't. I have the power to choose hell, but I can't choose hell. He says we're psychologically incapable because if you, it's like people are psychologically incapable of resisting a certain amount of torture. You know, you can say, I, I will resist torture. But like people are waterboarded. They always say, you know, oh, I could survive that. And then, you know, whenever journalists or Jesse Ventura, I believe, uh, experience waterboarding, they cave like that. Apparently it's like the worst thing in the world. You, you feel like you're drowning and panic overtakes you. Uh, so he suggests the same thing would be true of hell. Once you're in hell, you would repent instantly. You can say, "No, I'll be strong. I, I hate God. I'm gonna I'm gonna tough it out." And but bam, the minute you experience the torments of hell, you would instantly repent. Um, so you can get into that and the discussion of the foolish philanderer on page five ninety, um, which sounds like the movie um, Fatal Attraction, except instead of boiling a bunny. Uh, Glenn Close murders the family. Uh, Alright, so that's hell. Now let's talk a bit about heaven. As I said, it gets a little less press. Um, and actually, the, the problems that uh, that Walls discusses to do with heaven are related to hell again. Because the main problem of heaven is how could you be happy in heaven knowing about the suffering of the damned. Uh, I mean, suppose you get to go to heaven, because you, for whatever reason. Uh, th there's actually another issue um, that is not discussed in this chapter, uh, which is the, it's sometimes called the distinction between inclusivism and exclusivism. Exclusivists say, uh, only people whose faith is the right one will be welcomed into heaven. This is the Gandhi problem for, for Christians. Gandhi, of course, uh, famously regarded as a saintly individual. Uh, Gandhi was a big influence on Martin Luther King. His, uh, Martin Luther King took his method of nonviolence from Gandhi's nonviolent resistance to the British um, Empire in, in India. And it works. They they eventually got the British to leave uh, India, and India won independence. Um, so Gandhi is regarded as this saintly figure, but Gandhi embraced Hinduism. Ironically, he came to it late. Um, he read uh, the, the Veda 
after he'd left India, he didn't. He wasn't a Hindu as a uh, as a young man. He he came to it later once he had he had left India and was studying law abroad. Um, but he he in his later life he embraced Hinduism. So he's he's a Hindu. Um, does he get to go to heaven? What do you think, Christians? Well, if you're an exclusivist Christian, you say, sorry, it's the fires of hell for Gandhi. Because the way to get to heaven is to accept Jesus. And he didn't. He accepted Krishna. Bad mistake. He's burning. Uh, that would be the exclusivist view. The inclusivist view is, sure, Gandhi makes it because he's a good guy. You know, the only people who are in hell are those who are evil. You know, evil Christians can end up in hell. They can accept Jesus, and too bad. They, you know, suppose uh, Hitler accepted Jesus uh, before he killed himself in his bunker, or if you believe the stories, while he was living to a ripe old age in Argentina or Brazil. Um, too bad. He still gets to go to hell because, you know, it's your deeds that count. That's another thing the Bible is unclear on. Catholics say it's your deeds that count. Protestants say, no, it's it's you're accepting Jesus. And there's an equal number of verses on, on both sides. Um, so, uh, inclusivists, anyway, say you can get to heaven without being of the right, the so-called right faith. And obviously, if you're a universalist like Marilyn Adams, you believe that. Because everybody goes to, to heaven. Because we're all God's children. Um... But, you know, uh, if you're not a universalist, if you believe there are some people in hell, whether or not it's Gandhi or Stalin, um, whoever's in hell, can you celebrate in heaven knowing that there are people suffering in hell? You know, probably some of your relatives, maybe that person you knew in school. Um, and you didn't think was so bad, but, you know, they went bad after you knew them and they killed somebody, so it's hell for them. But, you know, you know that they were horrifically abused as children and you think, well, it's kind of they didn't have a chance. Uh, like, um, my wife knew a kid in school who she thought was okay, and then it emerged that this guy had, when he was a scoutmaster or something, had abu sexually abused many children um, and was, you know, sent away forever. But then it emerged that, like Jeffrey Dahmer, he'd been horrifically abused by his father. You know, you figure the writing was on the wall for him. Should you celebrate him burning in hell? The uh, great early American theologian, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who is mentioned at the beginning of this article, takes a hard line on this. He says, part of the joy of heaven is celebrating the suffering of the damned. Uh, it's like there are big screen TVs in heaven showing people burning in hell, and everybody's loving it. They're laughing it up. It's like reality TV in heaven is watching people suffer in hell. Because, Edwards argued, Otherwise, you're kind of questioning God's justice. God put these people in hell, in hell. They deserve hell. God would know he's omniscient. So if you don't celebrate their punishment, then you're criticizing God. And, you know, that's not really your place. So you should derive joy from other people's suffering because they deserve it. Now, that's pretty hardcore. And a lot of people think that that's too hardcore. And and that presents a horrific view of God and people in heaven. I mean, the, the angels celebrating the suffering of the damned seems a little sadistic. Uh, if you don't want to take that view, well, what do you say? Well, if you're not going to be a universalist, you have to deal with this problem. If you're not going to say that there are no people in hell, then how do you deal with it? And... Um, uh, Walls mentions three suggestions. He says, um, first suggestion, the blessed are in such a state of overwhelming bliss that nothing could disturb their happiness. Oh, those people are suffering in hell. I should feel bad, but I'm having too good a time. 
Again, that's not a, a, a nice view of the people in hell, you know. I would feel bad for you people who are being tortured for all eternity, but I'm having too good a time, so I just can't. I don't think that paints a very nice picture. Uh, but maybe that's me. Number two, um, they see the nature of evil with sufficient clarity that they can be at peace with the reality of damnation. This is kind of like uh, Jonathan Edwards' solution, that... Um, they recognize the evil of, uh, you know, we know what the evil you did. But then you sort of face the proportionality problem again. Okay, you know the evil they did. They killed some people. They, maybe they even tortured some people. But the suffering of those people was over pretty quickly. These people are suffering for all eternity. I mean, how much is too much? Uh Finally, um, the third suggestion is the blessed in heaven may not be aware of the lost in hell. So you get to celebrate in ignorance. Ignorance really is bliss. I wonder where grandma is. Oh, well, I'm having too much of a time. Uh, you know, oh, forget her. I'm having a wonderful time. I'm sure she's in heaven somewhere. Meanwhile, grandma is burning in hell. Uh, but you don't know. That seems, you know... Again, that makes God, I think that makes God look bad. I'm going to keep you in the dark about what's happening to people that might upset you. You know, it would upset you to find out what I'm doing to these people down here. So I'm not going to tell you. That makes God seem kind of sinister, I think. So I don't know about you, but I would need the more work on those solutions before I find them appealing. But I think all of them are better than Walls' actual response, which is, I'll read it aloud. Um, they should, uh, people who are troubled by this idea that, uh, you know, the people in, who, 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 who like Schliermacher and Eric Reitan say, uh, you know, you couldn't celebrate in heaven if there were people suffering in hell. So people like that, says Walls, um, should still feel that there is something profoundly wrong with the notion that hell should have any claim against heaven that hell should have veto power over the joy of the redeemed. Think of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 25 to 32. Um, I was amazed to discover, because, uh, you know, I had a good religious education. I went, I went to school in England and religious education was required. No separation of church and state. So I know the prodigal, the story of the prodigal son. We learned it in school. But I was amazed how many people in this uh, largely Christian country, don't know the story. So look it up, Luke, Luke 15, 25 to 32. The older brother refuses to come in to celebrate. I always rather identified with the older brother. The older brother stays home, works hard on the farm, whereas the young wastrel gets half his inheritance, buggers off to Las Vegas, blows it all on false friends, and then comes back and then the dad said, oh, it's wonderful to see you. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to throw you a huge party and kill the fatted calf in your honor. And the older brother says, wait a minute. I stayed home. I could have gone off and blown all my money, but I didn't. I stayed home and I worked hard for you. And, and the father says, shut up, you. You know, go back to work. Uh, how dare you not celebrate your younger brother coming home? That just seemed colossally unfair to me. I don't know if I identified with, with the older brother. Um, but anyway, why should the party stop simply because some refuse to enter the banquet hall? In other words, why should, uh, why should people in heaven not be able to celebrate just because of these people in hell? God cannot be held captive by such party poopers and spoil sports. So who is he calling a party pooper in spoil sports? Somebody who is troubled by the sufferings of all eternity of people in hell. Oh, they're party poopers. Hmm. Well, maybe you think differently. But uh, I think someone who is troubled by internal torment, party pooper is a little bit of an odd label for them. Um, and then finally, there's... oh. The final major puzzle is one that I discuss, actually, in uh, the other class I'm teaching online. So you can check online for, uh, I talk about this at length, um, for my uh, Mortal Questions class. They're on, uh, the video's on YouTube. 
It's a famous argument by a British philosopher, a con contemporary British philosopher. Well, he, he died a few years ago, but you know he was alive in the 70s and 80s. Um, he, uh, he argues that immortality would be unbearable, essentially. Well, actually, he says there's a philosophical problem for immortality. And by immortality, he means the afterlife. He means an afterlife in heaven. And he says, this is Bernard Williams, and it's not Bernard, because we say Bernard and he's English. He says, um, there are two criteria that must be met for it to be me that lives forever. One, the identity criterion. There must be, so uh, this actually ties into stuff that I said I wouldn't talk about, the problem of personal identity. But suppose... One of the uh, the worries about the afterlife is, well, what's this corpse? If you believe you're going to live forever, well, what are all these corpses that we're burying or burning? Aren't those the people and aren't they there? So who is this person in heaven if, if, there's, uh, if there's a corpse right here? And the usual answer given nowadays is an idea that is drawn from Plato, that there is this immaterial soul. But, you know, we have a very hard time picturing an immaterial soul existing. We, we tend to think of them as having, you know, like, like in Star Wars, blue outlines or something like that. We, we tend to think of them as ha taking on human form. And it's, there's certainly a strong tradition in Christianity of, of regarding us as having bodies after our death. So suppose we say, you know, the soul leaves your body and then enters some... or, or Suppose we say, upon my death, a person appears in heaven. Uh, let's assume I go to heaven, which is a big assumption. Uh, a person appears in heaven with all my memories, saying, phew, I'm glad there's a heaven and I'm glad I'm in it. Oh, look, there's my body down on earth being burnt. Um, how do we know this really is me? Well, you could say it remembers being me. It has all my memories. Well, that's not good enough because it could just be a, a fake given fake memories. If you've seen, uh, there's a, a movie, actually there, there was a, a, a science fiction writer who had the rather unfortunate name, Philip K. Dick, who was obsessed with issues to do with memory and personal identity. And a lot of really cool science fiction movies have been influenced by his work. Um, Minority Report, uh, the good version of um, Total Recall, the one with Arnie, where he says, get your ass to Mars, uh, and Blade Runner. All, uh, these are three, uh, and there's another recent movie called A Scanner Darkly. You should check that one out. That's very weird. That was the first comeback movie for, um, you know, Iron Man, what's his name, uh, Robert Downey Jr., um, he plays basically the same character he always plays, but it, it, it's a very weird movie with Keanu Reeves in it as well. All of those are based on the writings of Philip K. Dick, who's very interested in these these ideas of memory and, and identity. And if you remember, in, if you've seen Total Recall, you'll know that the Arnold Schwarzenegger character has false memories. And uh, this theme recurs in the, the Blade Runner, which is probably the best of all these movies. Uh, in Blade Runner, there's a bunch of incredibly lifelike artificial beings. They're called replicants. Um, they're not quite like robots because they're they're biological, but they're they're bioengineered. And uh, one of them doesn't know she's a replicant. Uh, she actually works for the 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 company that made them. She's the secretary, and she thinks she's a human being. And the character played by Harrison Ford in a very non hand solo performance has to break it to her that actually her memories are false. And the way he does it is he tells her uh, a story that she never told anybody, that she thought was uh, a memory from her childhood. And he knows about it because he, he read up on the reports and of the memories that were implanted in her. So she finds out that her memories are fake, that the person she thought she was, she isn't. She's just a, a clone given false memories. Well, that could be true of this person up in heaven who has my memories. Just because they remember being me doesn't mean they are me. They could just be 
you know, somebody totally different given false memories. But still, they must at least have my memories. So the identity criterion is uh, for it to be me, first of all, they have to be like me. So suppose there's someone up in heaven. So to go back to my previous example, suppose heaven really is people shouting hallelujah for every second of every day, doing nothing else but shouting hallelujah. And suppose when I get there, I love it. What Bernard Williams would say is, that's not me anymore. Now I can say, I remember being, I've changed. But he says, no, that's too much of a change. That's as if, you know, imagine the thing that you hate the most. And then 10 years in the future, there's someone who claims to be you who loves that more than anything. You would say, that ceased to be me. I don't care about that person because they're not me anymore. Or uh, this could happen if you lost all your memories. You would say, that's not me because they, they've lost the memories. They've lost the link to me. So for me to live immortally, the person in the future living for all immortally at every point in the future has to have enough of me, of me now for it to be true that we are identical. Otherwise, I cease to exist. There's someone in the future, but it's not me anymore. It's someone new. Um, so the identity criterion must be met. But also the attractiveness criterion uh, must be met. Because otherwise, I won't want to live forever. If I live, uh, there's a Gulliver's Travels is usually regarded as a children's book. It isn't. And usually they only focus on Lilliput. Uh, there was a god awful movie of it made re uh, recently with Jack Black that tanked. Um, but the, the image of it is he, wait, he, he has a shipwreck. This is Gulliver. And he wakes up on a beach and he's held down by pieces of tiny string by tiny people because he's landed on Lilliput where everybody's tiny. But in the book, there are many voyages. The first of them is to Lilliput. The second of them is to place book called Brobdingnag where there are giants. And this is all allegories teaching us things about human nature. One of the later voyages, um, he comes across beings, oh, I've forgotten their names, gold dugs or something. I've forgotten their names, but um, their curses, they are immortal, they live forever, but they never stop aging. And that is a curse because you just get more and more decrepit and life is more and more painful. You know, you hurt everywhere, your teeth fall out, you lose all memories, but you just don't die. That would be the worst possible kind of immortality. Nobody would want that. It would be much worse than dying. Well, to avoid that kind of immortality, uh, the, the future that is described has to be attractive, has to be one that I would welcome. And Williams points out that there's a major barrier to that, and that is boredom. Suppose I get to do my favorite things. Well, how long can you do your favorite things? A million years? Well, you still haven't made, you have, still haven't made the tiniest step towards infinity. If you exist for infinity, then a million, 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 billion, 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 trillion, zillion years is still nowhere to near to infinity. Wouldn't you get bored of whatever it is you enjoy? He says, of course you would. So the attractiveness criterion cannot be met. Or if it can, Suppose I become the kind of person who can keep going. Well, it would be the only way that would be possible is by abandoning the identity, either by, by forgetting constantly. I've uh, this seems new to me because you have lost your memory of doing it a million times before. Well, if you lose your memory, you cease to be you. You're a new person, and the original me who died has ceased to exist. So to achieve to the only way to avoid being bored is to lose identity. So the two criteria of identity and attractiveness cannot both be met by an immortal life. So consequently, immortality is not worth having. That's the argument. That's Bernard Williams's argument. Now, in response to this, um, Walls cites Garth L. Hallett has uh, surveyed six proposed solutions to the boredom difficulty. Namely, timeless beatitude, presumably this would be like, you know, being in God's presence is just 
timeless, or or there there is no time. You you become timeless when you go to hell, ha heaven. You're outside of time. I don't think we can conceive of that. I don't think we can conceive except as time passing, which is why the view of God as being outside of time is so alien to us, as I discussed when we were talking about God's properties. Heavenly continuation. I'm not sure what that is. Indefinite progress. You just keep changing. You you just keep changing slightly so that your interests change, and then but you run out. There's a finite number of interests that I, as a finite being, could enjoy. Subjective timelessness. I don't notice time passing. That's a way to avoid boredom. That to me sounds like what you know being in class was like when you were in school. Timelessness. Uh, there's a Simpsons episode where Bart looks at the clock in class and it. It slows down, it slows down, it slows down, and then it goes backwards because time is passing so slowly. Eternal youthfulness. Yes, well, uh, Bernard Williams has already covered that. He's assuming that unlike the strill bugs, I believe they were in, in Gulliver's Travels, you're not getting older, you stay the same age. And in fact, uh, Bernard Williams says that. He said that the ideal age was 42, which happened to be the age he was when he gave the talk. I think most of you would say it was younger. Uh, and creative contentment, that is, you're always creating new things. But, you know, even if you get joy out of creating pictures, could you do it for infinity? I mean, I, I get joy out of making things, but, you know, wouldn't you end up recycling your work? Um, there's a quote by Thomas Jefferson, who, who was basically making the same point, where he says, I can see where we die because I grow tired of getting up in the morning and putting my clothes on and then taking them off again at the end of the day. It's like, you know, same old, same old. Um, I'm ready for this to end. Um, and that's Bernard Williams' point. Anyway, that's the boredom challenge. Uh, clearly, um, Hallett thinks there's some kind of, that it can be responded to. Uh, but that's what the challenge is. Okay, I've rambled on for over an hour. I hope you made it to the end, and I hope you made it to the end of the course. Um, I've been a little behind on getting to papers, but I will now that I have finished every quiz, every paper topic, and every video, I've got nothing to do but grade papers, and I will do that from this moment on. Remember, you have to submit your final paper, and remember, you should have four papers, and you should have submitted three already. You have to submit your final paper by 10 p.m. this Friday. Um, any later than that, and I won't accept it. And you have to do the last quiz by noon on Sunday. Any later than that, and it will be closed. Because grades have to be submitted this coming Monday at 10 a.m. So I have to make sure that I can have graded it all. I hope that you've enjoyed some of this stuff. I hope you've got something out of it. And uh, with that, I bid you good.